There are plenty of classic cars that fall into distinct categories. We have the icons, the works of art, the victims of politics, and the total failures. Yet, quite obviously, very few fall into all of those categories. Yet this is a Triumph stack. So today on TwinCam, we're going to figure out how brilliance and catastrophe can so beautifully coexist. Before we get into it, this car is to be auctioned by Manor Park Classics. So if you'd like to be by far the coolest of all your friends, then please do follow the link in the description. But in the fullness of history, we've come to realize that while British Leyland failed, their cars were perpetually interesting and were punctuated with a series of ifs, buts, and maybes. The Triumph Stag is the ultimate ifs, buts, and maybes car. Because on paper, these things were a nailed on success, something I think you'd recognize from the styling alone. Yet through its seven year life, it became a problem, a fundamentally sound concept with a couple of almighty Achilles heels. But first, let's look to the badge, because we've covered a couple of triumphs before on Twin Cam, so if you're a regular here, you'll know that in the 60s and 70s, they were producing a range of premium saloon cars and brilliant sports cars. There's a reason they're so often referred to as Britain's BMW. That is, before BMW fell off a cliff. Our friend the Stag here came along right at the centre of that era in 1970, becoming Triumph's halo model above the iconic TR6 as well as the brilliantly regarded 2000 Saloon. In fact, it was from the latter that the Stag directly descended, being a child of the legendary Giovanni Michelotti, who barring the TR6 was responsible for styling all the contemporary Triumphs, his trademarks instantly recognisable. In 1964, the year after the 2000s launch, he asked Triumph to lend him one as he dreamt up a grand touring convertible. The plan was for Michelotti to showcase his talents at the Turin Motor Show, but Triumph loved it so much they denied him of the privilege, commencing development of the car that became the Stag. That concept, from six years before the car was launched, was very similar to the final product. While there are the obvious differences we'll get to, it is a Triumph 2000 with a shortened wheelbase and the roof chopped off. But it begs the question, why did it take six years to turn it into a production car? Well, the 60s were pivotal for the British motor industry, and for Triumph, it saw them go from an independent to a subsidiary to becoming a part of a giant conglomerate. British Leyland was always destined to be an unhappy marriage. It was the result of a forced merger between British Motor Holdings and Leyland Motors, both of whom had already undergone a series of buyouts and mergers in the decades before. BMH, for example, was the parent company of BMC, which itself was born out of a merger between Austin and Morris back in 1952. In 1966, they bought Jaguar, meaning BMH had control of seven marks. Leyland, on the other hand, was centred around commercial vehicles before branching out into passenger cars through its purchase of Triumph in 61, followed by Rover in 66. Therefore, in 1968, British Leyland had to deal with nine different brands, all now held under the same management, and it doesn't take a genius to see the political issues that all this would cause. But back to Triumph, and they had many more important models to deal with before the vanity of a Grand Tourer. First was their new small saloon, 1965's Triumph 1300, and that was followed by the TR5 and TR6, as well as development of an all-new state-of-the-art modular engine, the one we'd see under the bonnet of the stack. But that's for later, as for now, let's preface that with Giovanni Michelotti's spectacular styling. Every Triumph of this era was a great looking car, yet the Stag is a gorgeous blend of elegant and edgy. But in doing so, it ushered in a whole new family look for Triumph. As we mentioned earlier, the concept wasn't overtly a Triumph. 
So stylistically, it had little in common with the 2000 or 1300, which while being recognisable Michelotti designs, shared a bubbly and cuddly front end. The Stag, on the other hand, was all about sharpness. This slashed away front end would become the basis for the 2000s facelift in 1969, plus in paired back form, the Dolomite in 72. When the Stag eventually launched in 1970, little was anywhere near as scathing. Sure, there were aggressive cars out there, but they tended to be bulbous, while the Stag erred on the side of elegance and svelteness. It's actually a rather long car, what with those four seats to package. But with those mirrored front and rear ends and the haunching over its body, it's so animalistic. It's a living and breathing design that you pick up more of from every viewing angle. The starkest comparison is with a Mercedes-Benz SL or SLC, which may be more elegant and certainly better rounded, but the Stag is infinitely more sporting, more dynamic and more eye-catching. It's a fabulous looking thing. But with that established, what's the big T-bar for? Of course, the concept was a proper convertible, and while the Stag has a traditional canvas top, the T-bar takes away somewhat from the silhouette. And there are two reasons it exists. The first, thanks to the saloon car underpinnings. The Triumph 2000 was a revolutionary car for its manufacturer, very much the leap towards realising the image of Triumph that I've been putting across. But it was also their first car in that class to feature monocoque construction. And as a result, it wasn't the most rigid of cars. Something only exacerbated by slicing the top off. Early Stag prototypes were full convertibles, but they suffered horrendously from scuttle shake. So the T-bar is structural, and the Stag body shell wound up being substantially different to the car on which it was based. However, it was also a way of killing two birds with one stone, because in period, the US government was going on its Ralph Nader-led safety crusade, a result of which was the rumour that they were set to ban convertible cars due to rollover concerns. It is a bit fussy though, which means that with the factory option hardtop, I think the Stag is better as a coupe than a convertible. But that's all by the by, and having mentioned the Mercedes SL, there is something I want to make abundantly clear, and that's the fact that the Stag really isn't a sports car. Triumph may be forever remembered for their sports cars, but this is a GT. And while it made decent power for the period, a combination of weight and gearing means it takes around 10 seconds to get to 60. And when we learn that fact, we realise that this is all about cruising in the sunshine in comfort and immense style. So that neatly brings us back to that all new engine. And if we're honest, it isn't something they overly needed. After all, the 2000 and TR6 both used a brilliant overhead valve straight six, which in two and a half litre form with fuel injection produced 150 brake horsepower. But Triumph went down another route for two reasons. First of all, their little four-cylinder engine was an overhead valve design that maxed out at 1500cc, leaving quite a gap between the two engines. While reason two was the United States. With this and the T-bar, the US is a recurring theme of the Stag's development, but very close attention was being paid to what the American consumer wanted. After all, British Leyland sports cars sold better across the Atlantic than they did at home, and there's little the Americans love more than a thumping V8. In this case, it made sense to build a modular engine, giving us a 45 degree slant 4 and a 90 degree V8. In four cylinder form, we've met this engine before in the front of the Dolomite, complete with its aluminium cylinder head and overhead camshaft. But when we double those features, we meet the 3 litre V8 of the Stag. When you see them side by side, there's no questioning that these two are twins. And in this form, it produces around 145 brake horsepower. Now that may be less than a European TR6, but stifled by emissions, the American TR6s were lumbered with only 104 brake horsepower. 
meaning the stag really did represent a new halo model when viewed from overseas. Yet despite good intentions, the V8 is where the rot really sets in. Because as with everything British Leyland, Triumph had a difficult relationship with quality. We'll start with the cars themselves because it goes all the way back to the manner in which they were produced. Thanks to government policy in the 50s and 60s, many manufacturers were encouraged to expand their operations into different parts of the country. Triumph's traditional home was in Canley, near Coventry, and as a result of an acquisition, they opened a plant in Speak, near Liverpool, in 1961. Now, in theory, there was nothing wrong with this. But Speak was fitted out to build, paint and trim stag body shells, which were then transported over 100 miles to Canley for final assembly. This fracturing of manufacture added a massive degree of variation and risk to the equation, something only exacerbated by ever worsening industrial relations, never mind the disaster that was the engine. That all-new V8 had a timing chain that couldn't keep itself tensioned. It had a water pump that was both weak and poorly located, and those aluminium cylinder heads were poorly cast, meaning they warped when the water pump inevitably caused it to overheat. And without the correct antifreeze, everything corroded together into a V-shaped paperweight. These issues were unforgivable, but amazingly, they didn't once rear their head in testing. It was only once out in the world and in unfavourable conditions that the cracks began to show, by which point it was too late. The stag was warmly, if not spectacularly, received back in 1970. But to come back to a previous point, this isn't a sports car, and that matters because of the United States. You see, British Leyland had a virtual monopoly with its small sports cars over in the States, but due to tariffs, something of this size and price had to compete with Mustangs, something it wasn't designed to do, and that meant very few people actually bought them. And when the issues showed through, it was the end. The stag lasted three years in the United States, an unparalleled failure for something that showed such initial promise. So once back in the UK, the V8 was still the problem. And as far as I can see it, Triumph could have done three things. The first, by playing a diversion tactic, because the V8 wasn't massively impressive to start with. Sure, it sounded incredible, but it was only average in terms of power, something Triumph had the facilities to fix by virtue of the multi-valve head they developed for the Dolomite Sprint. In this case, the little saloon produced 127 brake horsepower, only a stone's throw away from the V8, so Triumph could easily have just blown us away with a 32 valve V8 in 1973 or so. But regardless, the Triumph V8 was the problem, so a much more sensible solution would have been to replace it. But here's where British Leyland comes in, because the politics are about to amaze us. When BL was formed in 1968, Triumph was placed alongside Rover in the Specialist Division, giving them the ability to share facilities and rationalise operations. The problem was that they were still acting like independents, lobbying BL's management for supremacy, something seen clearly in the development of the Rover SD1, one Rover won and Triumph lost. As a result, they each had something of an ego, and wouldn't you believe it, Solihull had a V8 of their own. The Rover V8 was designed by Buick, giving it proper American pedigree, and while it had push rods, it was all aluminium, and because it was so good, it survived through to the early 2000s. It would have made perfect sense, therefore, for British Leyland to rationalise a range of engines and fit the Rover V8 to the Triumph Stag. But that's to ignore both the politics and the fact that they probably couldn't have built enough to cope with demand. However, as we've established, Triumph had their good old straight six to fall back on, which, given its previous success, probably would have been the correct answer. Nevertheless, while the Stag was born from good intentions, it was unreliable, 
poorly produced and finally died as BL was recovering from bankruptcy in 1977. With that, you might expect them to be rare today, what with only 25,000 of them ever having been produced. Yet 9,000 survive, there or thereabouts anyway. That's a staggeringly high survival rate for any car, never mind one with perceived major engine flaws. But the problems were not serious. Triumph didn't come across any problems during development and testing because the engines were around the people that designed them. So with a few modifications and some careful maintenance, these V8s can be made reliable. And then you're left with an absolutely gorgeous, brilliantly performing and sonorous Grand Touring Convertible. And on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.